Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to invite uh, Dr. P.T. Alexander, sir, from the Department of Neurology to present a lecture on us to autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, sir is actually a DMG graduate of CMC. He uh, he's 2016 batch. Uh, sir has taken his time out for teaching us for the next one hour on this topic. Um, if you have any doubts, please put the questions in the chat box. In the end, you can directly ask questions to sir also. Uh, so over to you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank the Department of Medicine and Neurology for giving this chance to present the lecture on uh, autoimmune encephalitis, uh, mainly the clinical presentation and management. Now, by definition, what is it? it's a group of disorders where we have char the characteristics are that it's there are CNS symptoms uh, which can be localized to either mostly limbic, otherwise it can also be anywhere else including extra limbic, basal ganglia, autonomic structures, or any other place, uh, any other site of localization in the brain. Uh, and it occurs in association with autoantibodies directed at epitopes, expressed at, at uh, particular sites which are involved. Now, before we go on, let's start off with uh, a story where you have a young lady who is a journalist by profession, uh, very sharp at her work otherwise, and uh, well liked by her peers, suddenly within a short time frame, has a significant change of her uh, behavior in the sense she starts seeing things, she starts to visualize uh, things that are not there, uh, she starts to have mood swings, she starts to forget things at her work, and mind you, she was known to be very sharp at her work as a journalist, and she starts to make a mess out, complete mess out of interviews that are taken off uh, people in her work, uh, starts to forget her assignments and slowly within a span of few days to probably a week or two she starts to have the same symptoms very severe and with all this kind of presentation she is seen by her parents and then taken to the hospital uh, initially seen by psychiatrists because of all the odd behaviors that she is having um, but they all and even consulting neurologists who say who stated that she probably is uh, too tense at her work, was too stressed out, having a nervous breakdown, all these kind of things. And within a week or two, she goes on to have a seizure. So that's when they get alerted, oh, okay, this is not just a psychiatric problem or it's just not just a nervous breakdown. She's actually had a seizure. So what else can it? So once this came into picture, then she goes on to get admitted in the ward and then goes on to be seen by other uh, uh, departments and also a neurologist who is not in the picture till now, who goes back and takes a history in detail from her parents for almost more than an hour or so, and then goes on to tell her parents that, like told till now to head to them, this does not seem to be a purely psychiatric problem. There's definitely a neurological component. There's not just a neurological component, it's more like a neurological illness. And her descript his description to the parents who finally realized that, yeah, probably there is something neurological, was that her brain is like it's on fire. So it's like her brain is on fire. That was the description that was used. So that's a topic that uh, is prob probably a better definition and simplest definition for this uh, presentation. So what is that illness that we're talking about? So there's a disease with, which presents with autoantibodies. And these autoantibodies are classified as uh, depending on the location of the antigen. It could either be intracellular or on the cell surface. The ones intracellular are the anti who re, ma2, amphiphysin antibodies, a whole uh, bunch of them. On the other hand, the ones on the cell surface that's within or at the cell membrane is the NMD, NMDA receptor, the AMPA receptor, dopamine 2 receptor, and so on. So these antibodies are classified, like I said, based on the location of the antigen. Now, going on to talk about the autoimmunity, what is 
uh, we are talking about the B and the uh, T cell and the B cell mediate autoimmunity here. The extracellular structures, the immunity uh, directed at the extracellular structures are usually B cell mediated, mediated by the humoral immunity. And this is for the detected and autoantibodies are both markers and also considered of di direct diagnostic significance for the illness. Whereas those against intracellular structures are T cell mediated and having uh, the detected autoantibodies are markers, may not be of direct diagnostic significance uh, for the illness. Now, where exactly do these antibodies stay and how are they found in serum or the CSF? The autoimmunity provoked locations outside the CNS may be later transferred into the brain. How? First, it is produced uh, in some mechanism in the serum, after which there is a breach of the blood-brain barrier, let's say perhaps uh, a viral illness, uh, meningitis, viral encephalitis, anything of that sort, after which the antibodies in serum has a route of entry into the CNS. As long as only the serum has the antibodies and there is no breach of the blood-brain barrier, there cannot be a CNS the CNS involvement. On the other hand, if there's a primarily intrathecal synthesis of the autoantibodies, uh, the disease is likely to manifest in the CSF, in the uh, brain initially, and then may spread, uh, depending on the breach of the blood-brain barrier, outside as well. And here, irrespective of the seropositivity or of the uh, blood-brain barrier, the autoimmune encephalitis is likely to be considered. Now, going on a little more detail the, into the immunological mechanisms involved, the T cell mediated autoimmunity is usually because of a, it occurs with a destruction of the neuron per se, which is not the case in a B cell mediated, where there's a neuronal dysfunction, but it's not destruction of the neuron. Why that happens? Because in T cell mediated, it's usually a cytotoxic T cell mediated autoimmunity, which causes destruction of the, the neuron. And it's usually associated with uh, the paraneoplastic neurological disorders, which is why later on, even once treated, the recovery may not be that significant simply because there is a neuronal destruction that has actually occurred. In contrast to which, if it's a B-cell mediated autoimmune process, you have, an auto, the, uh, you have various uh, mechanisms by which there is a neuronal dysfunction here. One example being the uh, cross-linking of the targets after attachment of the antibody. There's a cross-linking and internalization of the antibodies and then causing a neuronal dysfunction, although not no loss of neurons in this setting. This is what we just mentioned in a typical B cell or a synaptic encephalitis. What you will see is an antibody getting attached to the receptor, then causing cross-linking of multiple receptors and then going into a internalization of these receptors, thereby reducing the number of receptors for access uh, to the, uh, for its function. Now, the same thing uh, in a little more detail is showing a labeling of, uh, in one, on one side, what is shown is uh, labeling in a cell surface antibody mediated illness. And on the other side, how it is in an intracellular, uh, intracellular uh, antigen with the antibody against it. Now we can see this is, these are all uh, rat, rat hippocampus immunolabeled with antibodies. Uh, in this side, you have the N, a patient's uh, sample with, uh, who suffers from NMD encephalitis taken, whereas this is from a patient who had paraneoplastic illness, uh, which expresses a WHO antibody. And in a magnification, you can see that with the blue, the blue uh, staining for the neurons, you can see that the antibodies are even on the last, the lowest one, you can see that the antibodies are attached uh, onto the cell surface of the neuron, not requiring, and this is in a stage where it is non-permeabilized neurons. And in this stage also, you can see that a multiple number of ant uh, antibodies have attached to the antigens available or the receptors available. In contrast to the intracellular uh, pathology where because this is a non-permeabilized neuron, you cannot have access of the antibodies into the cells and therefore you don't see any staining or the labeling pattern in the intracellular pathology. And 
these in the intracellular, there has to be a breach of the neuron or the destruction of the neuron for the in antibody to enter into the, into the cell and to find and attach to the epitope or the antigen. Now, these immunolo the immunological mechanisms described, uh, they are in agreement with the reversibility of the autoimmune synaptic encephalitis or the cell surface, mean, um, cell surface um, encephalitis with adequate immunotherapy, provided it is initiated at the earliest before further destruction uh, is there. Considering there is a B cell and T cell mediated immunity involved, there's no data to suggest that there is a complement mediated uh, injury in this form of encephalitis. Now, in the autoimmune antibody encephalitis that we talk about, which is the synaptic or cell surface antibody antigens involved, what are the, the proposed mechanisms in the same? So you have uh, a prior viral infection or a systemic tumor, which causes destruction of the cells, the neurons, which release antigens. And these antigens are present to the antigen presenting cell, like the dendritic cell, which are taken up. So the antigen is taken up into the regional lymph nodes. From there, we have the presentation of the naive B cell along with the CD4 T cell. And this, this makes the B cell to mature, causing differentiation into plasma cell, which goes on to release antibodies. Also, there's a memory B cell that stays and enters the blood-brain barrier at one point of time, which then differentiates on and matures into plasma cells and then secretes antibodies within the brain or in the CSF. What happens after that, once the antibodies are present, is, cell sp is specific to the disease that we'll be discussing in a while. This is what I just uh, discussed in the picture itself. And like I said, so depending on which antibody or which illness is involved, there are various, various mechanisms for the neural dysfunction to occur. For example, in case of GABA B receptor antibodies, there's a blocking of the antigen, NMDA receptor, there is a cross-linking and internalization. And in LGI1 uh, illness, there is a disruption of protein-protein interactions, which we'll be telling again as well. Now, these mechanisms are also influenced by the type of antibodies as IgG1, uh, for example, are more of cross-linking and internalizing the antigen, whereas IgG4, which is found in like the LGI1, is uh, more of altering the protein-protein interactions. The specific subtype of Ig immunoglobulin G has its particular uh, relation to the illness that is there. Now, the discovery of the synapse, the synaptic and the cell surface antibodies have been there for quite a few years, but has uh, significantly gone up in its number from 2007, uh, at which point in time the NMDER receptor was initially discovered and then uh, giving rise to a, a number of uh, discoveries of antibodies. Now going on to the illnesses in, uh, in specific, the first and the most common is the NMDER receptor encephalitis, which is considered the most frequent antibody associated encephalitis probably the second most common among the immune mediated, probably the third most common among all of the, all the uh, individual etiologies of viruses, uh, and then the ADAM, and then the autoimmune, uh, or the NMDR receptor encephalitis. As you can see, most commonly, it is, uh, occurs in young women and children, almost 80% uh, are involved in them. The syndrome is highly characteristic, going stage by stage, like in the story I just mentioned, initially presents with a neuropsychiatric phenomena, Later on, manifest with generally neurological uh, uh, symptoms or signs like seizures, memory problems, decreased sensorium, uh, abnormal movements or movement disorders, dyskinesia is involving orofacial. Here, a typical one being uh, orofacial, orofacial dyskinesia, where there's a chewing type of movement or a lip smacking type of movement, which is seemingly continuous. Uh, going on, some patients go on to have autonomic instability and uh, some into central hyperventilation syndrome. Now, this is initially a, a typical patient like this is usually initially evaluated under psychiatry, but the significant, when you go back to the history, it usually has a viral prodrome within a week or two prior to the presentation. It may also occur with partial syndromes with either the psychiatric only or the abnormal movements only or one bit of it only. 
and may also present milder phenotypes, which may not be easily clinically recognizable. But however, without treatment, almost all the patients eventually develop almost all the elements of the syndrome that we just mentioned. Now, 40% of the adult, uh, adult females uh, this over, the 18, um, over 18 years of age are usually having an associated ovarian teratoma, which can be found either unilateral or bilateral. And this can be in, evaluated and found on evaluation, either with an ultrasound, a CT, an MRI, or probably even may require a PET, or probably even may be missed in a PET, and can only be confirmed on a laparotomy. Compared to this age group, the age group of less than 14 or less than, nine, uh, less than 14 and above 65, cumulatively have less than 10%, uh, 10, less than 10% have a presentation with the teratoma. And uh, there are some cases where other tumor types other than the typical finding of a teratoma is also found. All findings are usually non-specific, which is the initial problem in such a scenario. The CSF, it may present non-specific uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis in, in majority and sometimes may have increased proteins and OCVs. MRI can be normal, but in about a third, you may ha have some non-specific uh, T2 or flare hyperintensities. EEG may have some form of non-specific abnormality in a majority, usually has a slow wave pattern, focal or generalized slowing, and usually disorganized without uh, specific or ep without epileptic discharges. Although there may be an overlap with some electrographic seizures as well. A typical pattern that is found in these patients, if at all, would be a extreme delta, what is referred to an extreme delta brush, where there's a, in, it's found in about a third. It, is, it gets a name from a delta brush pattern, which is seen in neonatal EEGs. And this may be associated usually, or more so with prolonged illness. And if it's an undiagnosed case of encephalopathy and you get a finding of an extreme delta brush on the EEG, one of the things you definitely consider here was, is a NMDA encephalitis. What is it? It is a generalized slow wave pattern, a delta in the background with areas of fast activity, which is usually beta or faster. Now, the antibodies involved, like I mentioned initially, is of the IG1, uh, IG1 subtype. It targets the, pre, the GLU uh, N1 subunit of the NMDA receptor, which is previously referred to as the NR1, and it's highly specific uh, for NMDA encephalitis. Now, this is the NMDA receptor, which has the NR2 and the NR1 subunit, and it's a glycine binding site as the NR1 subunit, which is targeted here. The antibody binding to the NMDA receptor results in uh, internalization, like we previously mentioned, of the receptor after cross-linkage. And once this happened, there's a reduction in the NMDA-mediated currents. This is a picture similar to what I previously showed, where you have the antibodies to glue N1 subunit of the NMDA receptor in a patient with NKF like this. So the pathological findings on uh, uh, biopsy here, on autopsy, is where you have plasma cell infiltrates in the brain and the meninges. And even in the teratoma, you may have uh, cells with a uh, uh, neuronal or a glial uh, cells from the uh, autopsy done on the ovarian teratoma. Going on to the next one, that's GABA B receptor encephalitis. It tends, uh, it affects both men and women almost equally. More than 50% are found to have an associated tumor and usually a small cell lung cancer. When the dis disorder is cancer-related, onset of encephalitis usually precedes the cancer diagnosis by a, probably a few months. The median age uh, being towards the elderly, middle-aged elderly, and the older set tend to have an association with a tumor here. The presentation is typically limbic encephalitis with seizures. The limbic encephalitis uh, presenting as memory loss, confusion, and then the seizures is usually temporary, a temporal lobe onset with a secondary generalization may also have present with status or subclinical seizures, which are seen on the EEG. Rare presentation would be other uh, areas involved, like the cerebr causing cerebral ataxia and obstetronous myoclonus. And, but that also may tend to gradually involve the limbic system and cause a limbic 
predominant encephalitis. The MRI here is usually abnormal in two third, uh, usually having a typical medial temporal lobe involvement, hyperintensity, can be unilateral or bilateral and consistent with uh, limbic encephalitis kind of clinical picture. CSF again, not very contributory, gives a picture of lymphocytic creocytosis. And the antibodies, which, is, which are to the GABA B receptor, may have uh, typically to the GABA B receptor, may also have associated other autoantibodies to T the thyroid peroxidase, GAT65, et cetera. And uh, so in this case, the antibody, like we showed in the previous picture, once the antibody is present, these antibodies come in a case of GABA B and block off the direct functioning of the receptor. So the receptor, the antibody comes and blocks off the receptor, not enabling further stimulus or further functionality of that receptor. And thereby the effective proteins down, uh, downstream are not uh, produced. Treatment-wise, the immunothera immunotherapy with tumor control usually results in a fair or substantial recovery. And even uh, in this type of encephalitis, the recovery is generally so good that even with a delay of treatment by months, you still generally have a full to substantial uh, amount of recovery. anti amper receptor encephalitis. It predominantly affects middle-aged women and more than 50% have uh, present with a gradual onset of subacute form of symptoms, typically the lim limbic encephalitis with confusion, disorientation, and memory loss. Seizures are found less than 50%, and 60% may have an underlying tumor uh, of the lung, breast, or thymus. MRI findings in this case, the, there is abnormal flare signal, again, typically in the medial temporal lobes because of the limbic encephalitic presentation. CSF showing, again, a lymphocytic pleocytosis. And the antibodies here, uh, are to the subunits of GLU-1, A1 A1 and 2 of subunits of AMPA receptor. And binding of these receptors to the AMPA results in internalization, like in the previous example of NMDA receptor. 50% have a history of uh, systemic autoimmunity in this in AM AMPA receptor encephalitis, like an insulin-dependent diabetes with the presence of GAD antibodies, hypothyroidism, or even Raynaud's. Additional paraneoplastic immune responses, including the cytotoxic T cell mechanism, is usually associated with a worse outcome because, like I mentioned, it becomes a paraneoplastic etiology with a cytotoxic T cell involvement, causing neuronal destruction itself than just a neuronal dysfunction. A majority in this case respond to immunotherapy, whereas sometimes if we have a relapse in about 50%, and even the relapses may usually respond to treatment although the response may be partial and over time with each relapse, there may be a cumulative uh, deficit collected. Going on to LG1 limbic encephalitis, the, it's majority, majority is found, uh, especially in the males about the age of 60, with limbic encephalitis kind of presentation of memory loss, confusion and temporal lobe seizures. Another characteristic finding is that more a majority, more than 60% have uh, associated hyponatremia and also present with the REM, sleep behavior disorder. Another characteristic finding in uh, LGI-1 limbic encephalitis is the presence of a facial brachial dystonic seizure, which is uh, found in more than a third of the uh, affected uh, people, where there's a brief tonic or myoclonic-like seizure and this is uh, considered both, uh, can be neither stated as completely a seizure, nor is it ruled out against as a purely a dystonia, because it has both imaging findings, probably which involves uh, the basal ganglia, and probably also has seizures seen electric, uh, on the EEG. And few of these patients also have a, a peripheral nerve involvement, that's a peripheral nerve hyperexcitability, so with a combination of CNS involvement and a peripheral nerve hyperexcitability, that is a Morven syndrome. These patients are usually less than 10% have an underlying neoplasm, so not uh, usually as 
commonly cancer associated as the previous examples or the previous illnesses discussed. MRI again would be a typical present, typical of a limbic encephalitis. Uh, I think we'll have an image uh, in the next slide. Although the seizures can result from uh, in similar abnormalities confounding the interpretation. So we made, like I said, we can either say that it's the facial brachial dystonic seizure is, it, it's still a, a debate whether it is only a seizure or only a dystonia because of the, uh, the findings on evaluation. CSF typically is normal, like in the previous uh, examples, may have inflammatory changes or OCVs. So the imaging having a typical limbic encephalitic uh, clinical presentation involving the medial temporal lobes, uh, having a flare uh, hyperintensities. And a similar picture, like previously discussed in AMP and GABA B, are also found because of the limbic encephalitis kind of clinical presentation. Again, here, once the antibodies are expressed, uh, it's found both in the CSF and the serum here. They target the uh, LG, LGI1 uh, antigen, and it's a secreted neuronal protein, the antibody per se, and it interacts with both the presynaptic and postsynaptic epilepsy-related proteins, the ADAM23 and the ADAM22. So what it does is once the antibodies are expressed, it prevents a cross-linkage of the uh, antigens, the LGI1, and causes disruption protein-protein interaction and thereby again downstream causing decrease in the amper receptor uh, activity. 80% of this population have a substantial response to immunotherapy, uh, whereas one third may relapse. Mutations in this are also generally found uh, in other conditions like auto autosomal dominant partial epilepsy with auditory features, which is the same as lateral temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a genetic cause. Going on to the Caspers, anti Casper to associated encephalitis. Again, symptoms involving both the CNS and the peripheral nervous system. The CNS showing the encephalopathy with cerebellar dysfunction, hallucinations, uh, and the peripheral nervous system involvement showing the peripheral nerve hyperexcitability or uh, neuropathy or a pure sensory involvement. This combination, again, like I said, well, like in the LGI1 or in the Casper 2, is a Morvan syndrome. It may have a coexisting immune med may have other coexisting immune mediated disorders as well, like myasthenia gravis with uh, positivity to AC ACHR and musk antibodies. Again, this condition is unusual uh, to be cancer related. May have in less than twenty percent, most commonly thymoma. Antibodies to Casper two, like in LGI one, are IgG four. Um, and the antibodies interfere, uh, how they function is by preventing the normal clustering of the, the voltage gated potassium channels, as previously shown in that previous picture, at the juxtaparanodes. This again results in the hyperexcitability of the peripheral nerves, which is the peripheral nerve, uh, nerve system manifestation of the illness. Going on to GABA A receptor encephalitis, made in age group of middle aged uh, to the elderly. Uh, presence with the, the progressive severe encephalopathy with refractory seizures or even status in about 90% of the illness, along with cognitive impairment, alteration of behavior, uh, depressed sensorium, and associated movement disorders. CSF here shows abnormalities more than 50% uh, with both pleocytosis, increased proteins, and OCBs. The MRI shows extensive MRI abnormalities on the flare, like in this image, you can see both cortical and subcortical involvement, predominantly in the frontal and temporal uh, areas. And this is a typical feature among all the other encephalitis that we just discussed, typical of the GABA A receptor encephalitis. These multifocal abnormalities may appear and disappear through the illness at various times, and it is not specific a lesion that stays uh, throughout the illness. 30% among them have an associated tumor, mostly a thymoma, and more than 50% have a partial or complete response to immunotherapy, even uh, with the despite the severity of the status epilepticus or the refractory seizures to start with. Now, most have a coexisting autoimmunity also, 
with antibodies to GAD and thyroperoxidase. It may be triggered by viral encephalitis to start with, with either HSV1 or human herpes virus 6, and may have uh, coexisting anti NMDA antibodies as well. The antibodies that target this receptor can relocate the receptor from synaptic to ext extrasynaptic sites, leading to a neuronal hyperexcitability and supporting uh, the uh, pathogenic role in the illness. A DPPX encephalitis, because you see a clinical presentation with a triad of significant weight loss, a cognitive dysfunction, neuropsychiatric in manifestation, along with a CNS hyperexcitability, uh, can present as agitation or even uh, movement disorders like tremors, then seizures, or even hyperexplexia. Along with this triad, it may or may, may not present with cerebellar and brainstem dysfunction as well. The weight loss and severe diarrhea in, is typical of this kind of an in, is in DPP encephalitis occur usually much before or for, about four months before the onset of the neurological symptoms. And this is where such a patient, because of the initial GI presentation, can undergo extensive uh, evaluation for the lookout for a primary GI disorder than a subsequent neurological syndrome that is pending. Uh, why this occurs? Because, because the myentric plexus is also enriched with the DPPX receptors. Uh, and the encephalitis here, like you previously mentioned, is a chronic and slowly progressive, progressing over months uh, from the onset of the GI illness. Some may develop a syndrome resembling a perm, which is a symptom triad, which distinct and the symptom triad, which is mentioned with the weight loss, seen as hyperexcitability and the cognitive dysfunction is what helps us to differentiate from the progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus syndrome. CSF uh, finding here, non-specific. MRI as well, again, non-specific here, like in NMDA. Tumor associations are unusual here and may have B-cell neoplasms. It responds to immunotherapy with relapses occurring with reduced, uh, initially reduced immunotherapy. The antibodies here will be a combination of the two previously mentioned. Two previously mentioned and may cause a reversible decrease of DPPX receptor. So reversible decrease uh, of the DPPX receptor cluster density and also uh, voltage-gated potassium channel abnormality. Going on to uh, the Iglon 5 disease. Sorry, hang on. So, going on to Iglon 5 disease, it's, there is a characteristic sleep disorder associated with REM or non REM sleep disturbance, along with abnormal movements and behaviors, and usually predominant in the early hours of sleep. It can occur before or concurrently with bulba symptoms abnormalities, chorea and oculomotor abnormalities, and less commonly here associated with a cognitive decline. This syndrome can progress over years or it can be rapidly progressive, in which case it can even have death within few months of the onset because of its poor response to treatment. A sleep study demonstrates uh, multiple sleep issues, a non undifferentiated non-REM sleep, a poorly structured N2, uh, REM parasomnias or even breathing dysfunction during sleep as like an OSA or strider. Evaluation here are usually normal, including MRI, EEG, CSF, and an EMG. Because of the involvement of sleep, even a hypocretin, CSF hypocretin, however, is also normal. Now, findings in this is that there is a neuronal loss and gliosis with an atypical topathy involved primarily involving the tegmentum of the brainstem and the hypothalamus. But there is no glial pathology, no grains, no global glial inclusions, which would allow classification within any currently known topathies. The antibodies here are again of IgG for subclass, and there's also found to be strong association with HLA, DRB, and uh, some in DQB as well. Going on to metabotropic glue uh, R5 antib antibodies, it presents with a viral prodrome followed by neuropsychiatric syndrome 
where there's a prominent psychiatric and cognitive dysfunction along with movement disorders, sleep dysfunction and seizures. This one was, this condition was initially described in two patients who presented with the limb, limbic encephalitic kind of picture along with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, this is the classical presentation of an Ophelia syndrome where you have, the syndrome is uh, taken after Shakespearean character, where you have uh, one person, that's the affected person, individual, being very dependent on almost everything on someone else and refuses uh, to do something by him or herself. And it's a vicious cycle where the other person also continues to give a feedback to the other, the affected individual as to what has to be done. And this is how the patient usually ends up presenting because they lose that autonomy of functioning and always want somebody else to be a backup for almost everything that they do once affected with the syndrome. CSF in this picture shows pleocytosis with OCB being present, may or may not be present, with flare abnormalities in both limbic and the external limbic regions. 50% have a tumor association here, usually the Hodgkin's lymphoma, and these usually respond well to immunotherapy and tumor, tumor treatment. Going on to uh, metabotropic blue R1 cerebellar dysfunction, all these patients affected are present with a typical cerebellar ataxia, rarely having other neuropsychiatric phenomena. Again, these are not cancer-related and uh, was initially described, again, in two patients with a history of Hodgkin's disease. Do D2 receptor or anti-dopamine 2 receptor encephalitis or basal ganglia encephalitis, it's fairly rare, but... Those who present are you when presents, it's usually in children as a basal ganglia encephalitis or other neurologic syndrome. These antibodies are also found in some with post herpes simplex encephalitis, autoimmune encephalitis, which comes after being affected by the viral illness, few weeks after the viral illness. Now, to 20% are generally found to have this uh, presentation post viral illness. Most have a concurrent uh, antibodies along with the D2 also have an NNDR receptor and have a good prognosis with full recovery with early immunotherapy. You can see the involvement in the typical site of the basal ganglia. Antineurexin 3 alpha uh, encephalitis was initially described in five with a prodrome, prodromal fever going on with uh, headache and GI symptoms and later on going into neurological syndrome of confusion seizures with depressant sensorium. Some of these patients, uh, two which were described, two of them who was, was described among the five initial, also had facial dyskinesia, which were more typically seen in the NMD encephalitis. Only difference here being, it was zero negative for, or the antibody was absent for NMD antibodies and positive for these uh, neurexin 3 alpha. MRI, again, usually normal. There may be partial recovery after immunotherapy with the patient's antibodies uh, decreasing the receptor cluster after the illness. So just to summarize all the ones that have previously already mentioned, now the NMDR receptor, the, pro the syndrome that is presenting is a neuropsychiatric phenomenon. The association other associations that it usually affects the young adults, usually women and children. And the response to immunotherapy is very good uh, with full to very substantial recovery in almost 80% or more. GABA B receptor, again, a typical presentation of a limbic encephalitis with prominent seizures, usually affecting the elderly age group with an associated cancer like an SA, the small cell lung cancer or could be a neuroendocrine tumor as well. These patients also tend to have full or almost uh, full recovery, which is dependent also on the tumor that is managed. Amper receptor, again, a limbic encephalitis presentation with prominent psychiatric symptoms affecting middle-aged and 70% having an associated cancer here. LGA1 antibody and Casper 2, which are the VGKC associated antibodies causing the LGA1 typically again presenting as a limbic encephalitis with a majority of them having hyponatremia with an REM sleep behavior disorder. A typical finding in this LGA1 is the facial brachial dystonic seizure 
uh, and the epidemiologically the most common affected are men, usually in the elderly age group. Less than 10% here are known to have associated underlying cancer, usually which is a thymoma, with good response to therapy. Casper 2 uh, antibody, CNS plus PNS involvement, may present as a Morvin syndrome, also can have limbic encephalitis, uh, can have other antibodies associated in the syndrome, and has a full to substantial recovery with immunotherapy. GABA A antibody receptor, this is the ones which are, which may be rapidly progressive with severe encephalopathy and typically the refractory seizures, more than 90%. The imaging here may be distinctive compared to the uh, other types of encephalitis where there's a flare hyperintensity in the cortical and subcortical areas that are involved. DPPX typically presents with a prodrome of uh, GI symptoms, and then the classical triad sets in, and then also may have uh, CNS manifestations like hyperplexia and perm like syndrome. The metabotropic glue R5 presents as an encephalitis, encephalitis, which is not specific, associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, tends to have a full recovery with the treatment of the tumor as well. The GLU R1 typically presenting as cerebellar syndrome with unu uh, unusual to have a tumor associated with the same. Basal ganglia or a dopamine 2 receptor encephalitis, uh, not typically with a tumor association, typically presenting in, the, in children and full recovery expected. Neurexin 3 alpha presents uh, typically with encephalopathy with seizures usually no tumor association and responds well, fairly well to immunotherapy. Lastly, the Eglon 5, which is an encephalopathy with sleep uh, behavior disorders, uh, including OSA or Strider, and can be preceded by cognitive or gain dysfunction. Management, like already mentioned during the, uh, among the each uh, encephalite that we mentioned, the principles are antibody depletion and immunosuppression. In tumor associated cases, the first step is to identify the treatment. The patients and patients whose tumors were not removed had less recovery and increased chance of relapses as well. So the treatment in almost all these cases would be corticosteroids initially with uh, and or an IVIG depending on the situation. Uh, and also uh, IVIG or a plasmapheresis we consider as a first line. Beyond this, you can go on to second line depending on the response seen. Either you can continue, if there is response, you can continue with uh, immunosuppression chronically, or you can consider second line with rituximab or cyclophosphamide or other agents that can be considered as second line uh, management. Rituximab here, the advantage is seen are it reduces the risk of relapses and it is typically more effective when used for IgG for antibody mediated diseases. The importance of all this being that despite the severity of the patient's symptoms, the majority of patients respond to treatment, except as in a case of uh, in the last thing that's that was mentioned in Eglon 5 disease, where the recovery is fairly poor. Putting, uh, putting that as an algorithm, the after the initial evaluation of such a patient, you see what the presentation is, rule out the mimics of uh, antibody mediated encephalitis. If you identify antibodies which are onconeural, that is intraneuronal proteins, like anti who anti mar 2 all those, you treat as an on, uh, treat the tumor and consider T cell suppression because that's the cytotoxic T cell mediated immunity that is considered here. On the other hand, if you get antibodies to cell surface or synaptic proteins, like the ones we just discussed, you consider in the initial first line treatment with corticosteroids, IVIG, plasma exchange, and also follow for a tumor removal, which is, a, which is significant. Now, if a tumor is not found, you continue with tumor surveillance and con continue with chronic immunosuppression if there was an initial response. If there's no initial response, significant response, you consider second line agents as well, 
rituximab, cyclophosphamide, or other agents as well. Now, initially we mentioned about the patient who had the typical presentation. So that was one of the patients who actually was diagnosed with one of the first few hundred patients was initially had a diagnosis of NMDR receptor encephalitis. The lady who presented with uh, a neuropsychiatric onset phenomena going on to be admitted with worsening of seizures and things like that. Now, why I put that into the into perspective there was because that happened a few years, just a few years back. And why we had that diagnosis is because a few years, just a few years prior to that, in 2007, uh, came out the discovery of NMDA receptor by Professor Joseph Dalma, a neuro-oncologist, who releases the paper that we can see him presenting the paper in 2006, which, was, uh, which later came out as a paper in 2007 where initially they thought the NMDA receptor is a paraneoplastic syndrome, but later on associated with tumor, tumor, ovarian tumor, teratoma. But later on, uh, further evaluation investigations and studies showed that it's not only paraneoplastic, but an antibody-mediated uh, encephalitis. And subsequent to that came the identification of all the other um, associated antibodies that we just mostly that we just discussed about. Uh, so with that, I think we can conclude the lecture and if there are any issues and doubts, please go. Thank you, sir. That is a wonderful presentation. Um, now, if you guys have some doubts, can you please put your questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask the questions directly to sir. In the time, can I just ask about Morvan syndrome, sir? Like, can you just tell us how, what do you mean by the peripheral hyperexcitability? What will they present like, sir, actually, in addition to the original um, uh, CNS manifestations? So, in such cases, you can have a CNS plus a PN, the peripheral nervous system involvement. This combination is what is referred to as when a patient presents with this combination, you have this, this particular combination is the syndrome, Morvan syndrome. It can be part of the encephalitis with the, the CNS involvement, where you can you may identify an LGI-1 or a Casper-2 uh, antibody. These both previously were thought of as voltage-gated potassium channels. They are no, no, no longer considered as the uh, potassium channels per se, but are associated, are part of a complex of the uh, voltage-gated uh, complex, uh, potassium complex. Now, in Morvan syndrome, this PNS or the high peripheral nerve hyperexcitability comes in the form of a it, it continuous, just to describe it, it looks like continuous fasciculation, like how a element uh, syndrome with fasciculation sets in. You'll see continuous fasciculation, the continuous movement or a rhythm of muscles that you can see. I, if I had a video, I could show you. I try to load it, it's not possible. So that's the that is what is referred to as a neuromyotonia, which is one classical form of the uh, peripheral nerve hyperexcitability. So these are these are the presentation that come in such a syndrome. And when these come along with the CNS involvement, uh, with the identification of the antibody, that is the the two examples are the LGI one and the Casper two and Ketlin. Uh, so one more thing is the oncogenic antibodies when you the, when you classify, yeah. you said uh, you cancel directly T cell suppression. So for that patients, what medicine they should use? If suppose onconeural antibodies are identified, then we remove the tumor. The same, we can we can consider the same. The, with the drugs that are involved, we can consider the same uh, immunosuppressives that we have already mentioned. But the main treatment there is in a paraneoplastic syndrome to identify the tumor is of prime importance. These tumors can be associated with the at the time of the encephalitic presentation, uh, generally thought to be can be the encephalitis can present within five years of the tumor or even before the tumor itself is identified. So that is the importance of tumor surveillance in these patients.
even on follow up even not just uh, treating with immunosuppression so ivig and plex also as well yes yes corticosteroids ivig and plex as a first line so do pulse this patient sir yes i mean that is i mean we would pulse uh, as a management that is done differently by at different centers but we would definitely prefer to pulse the patient with steroids because that has its own advantages if there is any other questions sir we can close the session uh we, from the department of medicine we like to thank uh, dr alexander sir for spending this much time with us thank and, you uh, giving clarifying all our doubts about this important topic thank you sir thank you very much